Well, good morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Chris, good morning. Good to see you. Good to see all these smiling faces. Ruth, good to see you. All of you, good to see you this morning. Are there any announcements that people have for today? Barb, please. So what day? What day should we? What's our deadline? Next Sunday? After worship. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Steve? Lisa could probably tell you more, but um, I don't know if some of you know that Tom Whitcock, uh, Leah's brother, is in the hospital in the pier with uh, lymphoma. Okay. So we'll pray for Tom, and also we'll pray for Linda. Uh, a uh, good welcome to all of our people listening on Zoom this morning in the public and also on Facebook. Welcome. Any other announcements this morning? Um, just besides what Barb had said, um, hold all those people in your prayers. And just a reminder today, we're going to be having a little moment in which we can um, talk about Betty. Um, who of course was a member of our church, and there'll be a time during the service in which we can um, remember her. So we'll, you'll see that during the part of the service. Um, keep in mind that our service is being streamed on Facebook and over Zoom this morning, so keep that in mind as we make our comments today. Anything else? Ruth, do you have anything? Okay. Well, well, I got it here. This is the fun of Zoom. We got to meet everybody. All right. Uh huh. I don't. Okay. All right. Jack of all trades this morning. All right. Let us center ourselves for worship this morning with a moment of silence. Clear our thoughts in our minds and prepare for worship. Thank you. Well, let us begin our worship with our call to worship. Would you please stand if you are able for our call to worship? Or stand in spirit. If you are tired from carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. Take the yoke I give you, put it on your shoulders, and learn from me. I am gentle and humble, and you will find rest. This yoke is easy to bear, and this burden is light. Christ calls us, my friends, to come to worship this morning, to rest from the things that are troubling us, to learn what Christ can teach us about life. To realize that we can offer to others, and so to return into the world to serve. Let us worship God. Let us pray. O oh God, we gather together in your presence with expectation, hungry for an encounter with you, eager to hear your word. Open our eyes and ears to the presence of your Holy Spirit. May the seeds of your word be scattered amongst us this morning and fall on fertile soil. May they take root in our hearts and lives and produce an abundant harvest of good words and deeds. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our teacher and our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you please now remain uh, standing? Uh, for our first meditative hymn, All Things Bright and Beautiful. Uh, again, we ask you to hum or sing it very softly.
short as disciples of christ we have failed with our words and our deeds so let us confess our sins to our lord and savior god you have given each of us many gifts sometimes we can't recognize that gift we have to share so we hide it under a bushel god you remind us that all gifts are needed but sometimes we cannot recognize what gift we have to share <laughs> Sorry, I think I repeated that one. That's all right. <laughs> live and learn. God, you call us to work, to live, to love together as parts of one body. Sometimes we decide that membership of the body is limited by our understanding. God, for the times we have ignored or mislabeled your gifts, for those times we have cut another off from the body, we offer words of repentance. We ask for forgiveness and grace. Friends, hear this for pardon from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and our Creator. God is the giver of many gifts. God is the creator of one body. God is slow to anger and quick to forgive. God helps us to share and honor the gifts of all. God helps us to heal the wounds and reunite the body. We are forgiven, loved, and accepted. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. and his letter to the Corinthian churches. Today we're going to hear a little more from Paul, uh, what I would call one of his masterpieces. Here are these words now from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is proselytizing, then prophecy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, 
do it cheerfully these are the words from the apostle paul well grace and peace to you my friends from our lord and savior jesus christ good once again to see all of you this morning so this morning we're going to look a little bit at paul in this as i said a masterpiece that he did in romans romans is a part of the new testament we haven't really looked at the past six months and this is going to be a two-part series today i'm going to be focusing on this one particular scripture passage that basically deals with new living and new life that paul outlines in romans next sunday is the trailer of this two-part series i'll be talking about righteousness looking at what paul says about righteousness so today is part a of this two-part sermon in series we've spent a fair amount of time looking at paul and if you remember from our past discussions paul has always written letters to churches that he helped found as the apostle to the gentiles but this one is different this morning because he's in romans he has never visited this church he's not addressing specific issues to the christian church in rome this morning so this is different Paul did not, just for a little background information, he did not organize the churches in Rome, unlike the other churches that he did as the apostle to the Gentiles. Paul does know a little bit about the Roman Christian churches. We do know that he was familiar with 27 people from the churches in Rome, either by their reputations or by having met them before. This morning in Romans, Paul pours out his hearts, his heart, I should say, and his thought in this letter to Romans. For a little more background, Paul penned this letter to the Romans about 25 years after Jesus died. He wrote Romans in Corinth. You should be familiar with that because that is where, of course, he wrote his two letters to the Corinthians. Cor Corinth was a city containing many Christian churches that he visited knew very well so from his office from his spot alongside the road and with his disciples paul is looking ahead he wants to visit the christian church in rome but he decides to write this letter first though paul's got a little sideline trip to do before he goes to rome he needs to go visit the mother church in Jerusalem to deliver funds that he collected from those numerous Gentile churches that he helped found. Apparently the mother church in Jerusalem was poor and it needed an infusion of cash, or coins I should say. We don't know if Paul actually ended up visiting the Christian church in Rome. We do know from scholars that he did live in Rome for two years proclaiming the kingdom of God and preaching about Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance, as Acts describes. Paul's letter to the Romans, my friends, essentially ended up being the last letter that he would ever write. It would be his last will and testament, if you will. Because, you see, most scholars believe that Paul was in Rome during the leadership of Emperor Nero. If you remember from your church history in 64 AD, a fire broke out in Rome. The emperor blamed the Christians for starting that fire and ordered many of them executed. Nero used the Christians as scapegoats, including quite possibly Paul and even Peter. Both Paul and Peter may have been killed, crucified, or beheaded. So this morning in Romans, Paul pours out his thoughts in this letter to the Romans. And in Romans, my friends, Paul offers up a practical theology that details for his readers and for us today what it means to be a Christian, how to practice being a Christian. In these verses this morning, Paul lays out an important useful truth about what it means to not only be a Christian, 
but to be faithful Christians. Paul says our focus must not be on this world, where we are right now, in this here and now, but what, but what is important to Christ's teachings. He says we're to renew our minds, engage in sacred mindfulness, transformative grace, and make sacrifices if necessary. He also implores Christians and us to engage in promoting unity in society. Friends, what Paul powerfully and masterfully accomplishes in his letter to the Romans is basically what I'd like to describe as a manifest, a basic theological premise that had not been in effect in the early Christian church years. A theological premise for how, how all Christians have been given new life in Christ and must now engage in a new way of living. So what does this new look, this new way of living, look like? Paul spells it out in his letter. First he talks about there is now a new purpose for one's body and one's mind. Our minds, our hands, our feet, our complete selves are to be used now for the greater good of humanity. Our actions, our hearts, and our souls must be acceptable to God as Christians. This happens, Paul said, when we transform ourselves according to the will and wish of God. And we do that by starting to put the needs of the poor and the oppressed around us and the values and the teachings of Christ first over the value systems of earthly institutions. That's transformation. That's what Paul meant when he said, do not be conformed to this world. Transformation. It's a continual process, isn't it? It takes time and nurturing of it by people around us and patience. But we must be transformed, as Paul said, discern the will of God and know what is acceptable and perfect in the eyes of our Creator. When Martin Luther King Jr. led a nonviolent movement to transform the soul and the laws of the U.S. in the 60s, he grasped something about maintaining his balance while seeking to discern the will of God and to be transformed. I think his words are illustrative and instructive. King said this, Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless effort of men and women willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. King goes on to say, we must use time creatively in the knowledge that the time is always right to do right. The time is always right to do right. The early Christian communities of Paul's time were all about transformation. Such transformation is key for our Christian communities today, I think. Jesus' mission, his teachings, his actions were very radical in their nature for that time. Or to put it another way, they were transformational. Kurt Struckmeyer, who is the author of a book called A Conspiracy of Love, following Jesus in a postmodern world, talked about this. He said, Jesus calls on us to transform the world. He calls on us to spend our lives in the service of the least, the lost, and the lonely. Discipleship should result in people who lead a radically different type of life. Jesus called people to follow him in a new way of living. Paul more or less said that, in Romans this morning. The life of a Christian should first and foremost be guided by the values and the teachings of God and Christ. Paul stressed that our lives are also to be a testimony to the teachings of Jesus. Jesus' mission, Struckmeyer noted elsewhere in his book, was essentially about an implementation of a governing style of God on earth. God on earth. 
that godly earthly governing style takes precedent over any earthly institutions or interests. This governing style of God on earth that Christ sought calls for not just offering service and charity to people who need it, but seeks a wholesale transformation of our social order that will, in the end, eliminate suffering and need among us. In Paul's time, if we go back to those early days of the Christian church in Rome, in Paul's time, Christians were called to live a life exemplary of Christ's teaching and put Rome second and Christ first. In today's vernacular, we might have said in Paul's day, this thing that I saw recently in Sojourner's magazine. Sometimes being a good Christian means you have to be a bad Roman. This need to follow Christ, my friends, and to live out the values of being a Christian are just as important today as they were in Paul's time. It's a constant process. I know in my own experience, each day I run across situations in which a decision has to be made. Leadership has to go forward. Do I react to these situations with my glasses as a Christian? Or do I put on the glasses that represent earthly powers and institutions? What glasses should be the strongest? Well, as I have come to learn, and perhaps you have too, the glasses of Christ are more important than anything else when it comes to transforming. So friends, in Paul's message from Romans this morning, Paul says, for those Christians and for us, we are to have a new focus. Life is no longer about hurting people around us, but loving them and caring for them. Life is no longer about the acquisition of stuff, but about the acquisition of a spirit of love and compassion and understanding for people. The life of Christianity is about humility and the care of each person. Lastly, Paul talks about gifts. Gifts that are to be used, what he called the body, the body. And in Romans, Paul highlighted about these gifts, the gifts that we have that were given by God, natural born talents given to us by our creator. They are to be used for the body. In this case, the body of the Christian church with Christ as its head, as well as the family of humanity. Paul brought a very interesting analogy about this body. And when we think of it, we think of our own human bodies. Think about this, we have unique parts of our body. We have our ears, we have our eyes, arms, legs. Our heart is pumping blood. Every different independent part, what is it doing? It's working for the common good, for ourselves, so we can function with a normal body. Each part of our body has a unique gift that it gives to our whole self. All working together to make our bodies function and move. Paul says each of us have different talents from God to use them for the greater good. This congregation, the church universal, and humanity. And when we use those talents, my friends, we use them to honor and glorify God and Jesus Christ. So this morning we hear from Paul theology and a way to be a Christian. Paul gave us the, the 101 basics of being a Christian this morning in Romans. And he gives us answers about life and living as disciples of Jesus Christ. I think his words are worth repeating and being remembered over and over. They keep us grounded in what's important as individuals, a congregation, in a church. And I think Paul powerfully this morning tells us what's important and what always needs to be kept at the forefront of our lives. You know, often I've read about how some want to display in buildings the Ten Commandments 
and other parts from the Bible. Well, my vote would be to use these words out of Paul today in Romans, for they remind us of what comes first, especially recognizing the challenges we face as a nation and a state with poverty and hunger. All conditions present in the time of Paul and the early Christians, just like they are here. What I find interesting, Paul was way ahead of his time and ours by offering us a new way of thinking and seeing the world and humanity. I am confident, I am confident that we will continue holding these words of Paul close to our hearts and mind and reflecting in our words and actions this new thinking that God, Christ, and Paul gave us in the world. Paul's words are about authentic discipleship and being fully in one body in Christ. This sanctuary that we are in this morning, you are part of that body, that body of Christ. So let us continue as living, breathing, and faithful examples of Paul's words to live by as children of God and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. We are here to think about many things. This morning, we ask you to be with us, guide us and lead us. And we ask you to always be near in these challenging times. Lord, we pray for those in our midst who are suffering loss of some kind, loss of a job, loss of a loved one. We pray for those who are having health issues. We ask Christ, your son, to especially be close to them right now, to help heal them, to give comfort to their families, and also to provide comfort to those who have lost loved ones. Lord, as we do every Sunday, we ask you to be with the peacemakers, the ones who are here to help bring calm to the world so all may live together, all may have food, all may have peace. And Lord, we pray for our government officials that lead us and guide us wherever they may be. May we work cooperatively with them to help bring about the change that you ask us to do here in our country and the world. Now, Lord, we pause and we offer you in silence our own individual prayers and petitions to you. say quietly to you our own version of the Lord's Prayer. Let us say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right.
i offer this prayer this morning for our tithes and offerings that we have received by generous hearts god we present our tithes and offerings as a sign of our praise to you may we be abundant in our living and fruitful with our lives and may we work always with your grace and guidance to help those around us amen steve i'm wondering if you can back up to that slide about betty before we close with our meditative hymn um we are here today to honor with a moment of silence and any recollections that you wish to make about um betty schaller who passed away back in april betty formerly was of howard city loving grandma of eight great grandmother of six former beauty salon owner of betty jean's best little hair house betty was an avid lover of bowling an avid shopper of art band the family asks that any memorial contributions you wish to be made go to hope united church of christ food pantry in clinton township and i'm told there is a memorial service that will be made for her at a later date let us pause to offer a moment of silence for betty former member of this church and to remember her and her gifts that she brought to us in the world as a disciple of christ Lord, we thank you for the life of Betty and for being with us. We are comforted by the fact that she has been in your arms of your love and that of Jesus Christ. We thank you for the fact that she bettered all of us, brought joy to us and her loved ones. Good and faithful servant, Betty, we rejoice that she is now with you now and forever. Amen. Are there any folks that would like to stand up one at a time and say anything? Betty, I can describe in two words. Forthright and fun. Betty uh, was a person I would go to for advice when things were really sticky in my life. And she would just cut through fog and give me the that I really needed to sort my issues out. She was wonderful to talk to. She was warm and friendly and a joker. We love humor. And I remember several times when she, Randy, myself, would almost be uh, sore from laughing at a joke or some kind of funny little ditty we found on paper. I loved her. She, uh, I remember when she got married to Don, it was kind of spur of the moment, or so it seemed, that they got married during a church service here. And only a few years later, uh, she lost Don, but she carried on. I mean, she was a, a great person, a great friend, and I will always miss her.
when they were living on the farm and then later on in the condo, I remember visiting the condo and uh, Betty had this attack hat that you really had to be careful over. <laughs> 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 I remember moving things up and down those steps of the condo, I don't know how many times. Eventually they uh, died to go to the nursing home. Our um, choir went down there one time, I don't know, Ruth probably remembers her choir going down there, and Betty was so attentive to Don there through the whole time that he was there in that nursing home. I was just so faithful in seeing his decline, and yet she was there for him. Um, and just so commendable. We went down there to sing, and I brought a, we brought a bunch of um, Christmas uh, words for the songs. And of course, we didn't practice the Christmas songs, because everybody knows Christmas carol, <clears throat> knows the Christmas carols, but uh, we messed up on a lot of them. We were happy that most of the people there didn't know how to hear very well. <laughs> That day, because we were off key in some of those things. And then somebody asked us to sing 12 Days of Christmas. And I think one of them asked us to just jingle bell the lock or something, you know. Like, oh my goodness. I don't think they gave them the words to jingle bell rock. Um, but it was so fun to, to be with Betty. As I said, she was quite a card, quite a humorous. Um, I can tell one instance, unless a Randy wants to tell them. <laughs> I don't know, we were, we were having some sort of party here at church, and I don't even know what the function was, but at, toward the end of the party, uh, Betty said, oh, you know what, they brought some wine coolers here. Yeah. And, so, <laughs> and so, you know, but we can't let you go back with your wine coolers to home, so um, we <laughs> she brought them here in the front steps of the church, the little cooler, and a bunch of us were sitting there drinking these wine coolers on the front steps of the church. Of course, Pastor Renee comes up and looks at us there, and she says, you know, I think it would be more appropriate if you were to move to the patio behind the parsonage. But we were all really comfortable there, and we were having a good time. None of us moved. <laughs> That was all Betty. That was all Betty's doing. We'll let it on there. Now, it was one of the bad things that we're going to remember. Uh, this is on the footsteps of the family.